Hashtag psychotherapy on Fox with Mark Fielding. Hello. Welcome to Series 5, Episode 16 of Hashtag Psychotherapy Unfolds. As you know, I'm Mark Fielding, psychotherapist and relationship counsellor and your host. Today, I have the absolute pleasure to talk to our return guest, Carlos Vasquez. Regular listeners will remember Carlos coming on the show in Episode 4. Actually, it was our most popular show in Episode 4, How to Battle. Uh, I felt a good introduction would be to read from the last page of Carlos's book, uh, Warrior in the Garden, Seven Rules for Men, which we'll be talking about extensively today. Um, and on the last page about the author, um, it's written, Carlos Vasquez embodies resilience and transformation as an entrepreneur, motivational speaker, thought leader and strategic advisor. He has devoted his life to empowering others. He is the founder and CEO of How to Battle, an innovative coaching and consulting firm. Carlos's journey has been shaped by significant challenges, including 17 years of incarceration, incarceration, battles with homelessness and addiction, and enduring three gruelling years in solitary confinement. These formidable experiences have molded him, in, molded him into a powerful advocate and mentor using his profound insights and wisdom to inspire and guide others towards achieving their best selves. Carlos Vasquez's story is a testament to the power of perseverance, the significance of personal growth and the boundless capacity of the human spirit to overcome and excel. Yeah, I, I was really glad to start there, Carlos, because I mean, having interviewed you before, that really fits, doesn't it? Because you have pushed through so much in in your life. I, I wonder, for our listeners that didn't listen to your first interview, could you tell our listeners a little bit around what brought you here, the experiences that kind of brought you to this point? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, for having me back, Mark. I uh, really, truly love your podcast um, and just love what you're doing. Um, for the listeners that don't really know, you know, about me, um, I'm just like, I always tell people that I am just another story because there's so many people in this world who have their story and sometimes their story is never told. They don't ever get an opportunity to share it, um, yeah. whether it's because they don't live through their experiences. They're not here anymore, or they're just not able to be vulnerable. But yeah, um, yeah so I'm just, uh, I, I you, you know, you read uh, the intro and, and which is in the, the back of my book, but um, I, I always feel like that, you know, my struggles and the things that I went through just kind of made me into who I am today, which is a gift because a lot of things I went through especially in my younger age, um, I sh technically shouldn't even be here. If you look at it from a point of um, just statistics, I guess you would say uh, just, just circumstances. But um, yeah, I, I, um, I, been, you know, I grew up in a really good family, um, but my family broke. Uh, my father left and um, because of that, my mother went into a depression and, and I felt disconnected from my mother. So I ran away from home at 13. I ended up in the streets, sleeping in a car, uh, got addicted to drugs, alcohol, got involved with the wrong crowd. By the time I was 18, I was on my way to prison uh, with a 20 year sentence. And um, that became my new home. And I remember feeling like, um, you know, I would never get out of prison, you know, with that much time. And the fact that I was young, I figured I would catch life, a life sentence. And so for my first 10 years, I was just getting into more and more trouble. And uh, I can't tell you how many times that uh, I got into a situation where I, where I was potentially going to be catching a life sentence because of it. And, you know, now I, I, being able to overcome that and not, not real, made me realize that, you know, God had a bigger plan for me. So um, after 10 years, I transformed my life in solitary confinement when I, when I was there for three years. And um, I transformed my whole way of thinking and got out in my last four years in prison. Um, I started to help others. That's why I first started coaching with the lifers in prison. And I started to see the impact. Um, and they let me out early because I changed. And I got out three years ago. Uh, my three-year anniversary was last month. And 
I've just been on a mission to, um, to in, in living my life to the fullest, fullest every day. And I think that's why I've made so much progress since I've been out. And and in your just referencing your your first book, the price, and we and the last interview, you talked a lot about um, finding your purpose, and mm -hmm. and I guess that really comes through in your story. I mean, I, I guess you found your purpose. And before before we get into into the book, Carlos, could you just tell our listeners a little bit about the work you do because you do so much work with so many different groups now. I wonder if you could just just say a bit more about the work you're currently doing. Yeah, well, first and foremost, um, you know, speaking, do a lot of uh, speaking, whether it's at a foster youth home all the way to corporate. And uh, my messages are mainly based and framed around the principles for success, the price, the, the concepts for my first book. Mm -hmm. um, I've molded them and adapted them to just different scenarios and different situations, different audiences. But I found that these principles that helped me to transform my life um, actually uh, are universal principles that anybody can use in their life or in their organization to improve. So speaking um, has been a big thing for me, and I've been blessed with the opportunity to get many of those, and I'm still doing that. And uh, my, you know, I'm I wrote my second book, so um, writing is important to me, and I'm already thinking about ideas for my third book. Mm -hmm. So being an author, getting my message out there through that way, uh, coaching. So I'm doing coaching um, with the youth. Um, and then those that work with the youth, so organizations that work with the youth, coaching them, but then also coaching the youth. And then um, working as a consultant uh, with uh, corp corporations, you know, working with them and helping them to uh, shift their mindset and their culture and the way that they normally do things because they're always trying to improve. And so um, I've, I've found my way into all those areas and um, it's kind of like, you know, you just start something, you never know where you're going to go. You end up finding different doors, you open them and then, you know, you okay. enter there. So those are the things that I'm really doing now. Yeah. And it, it, it's so true about the doors. Yeah. You open, I mean, I guess this is the kind of forward movement and pushing through, isn't it? You open one door and there's a series of doors behind it. You walk through one of those doors and there's more stuff behind it, you know, and I guess... I mean, I guess you're really busy because when I follow you on LinkedIn and you're talking to all yeah. sorts of groups, you know, I mean, the message is a universal message. You know, I guess your story, I mean, I'm a big believer in post-traumatic growth and, and obviously there's, you know, nobody wants to experience trauma and there's a big negative side, you know, that people carry. But, but I think your story is inspirational in that, you know, it is a story of post-traumatic growth. I mean, in, in our first interview, you referenced... Um, Victor Frankl and your story, even though Victor Frankl was a completely different story in some respects, very, very similar in you know in the way you've pushed through. So, so let, let's get into the book, Carlos. Um, I'm going to hold the book up for our, for our YouTube listeners. Um, I loved the book. Uh, read it a couple of times, and and I also love it. I mean, Seven Rules for Men. You know, I mean, we talk a lot about men and mental health on this podcast. You know, and. Uh, I think it's really good time. I mean, it, it's. I mean, I would say seven rules for men. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the some of these, a lot of these rules probably would be applicable to you know, to anyone, you know, gender to women, you know. But just a book to speak to men, I think, is so important because there's not enough, I think, out there. In, you know, men's role in society is so confused now. So, what made you write this book? Why? Why did you? Yeah. Write this <laughs> <laughs> well, um, when I was in prison, I went to prison when I was uh, 19 years old. I just turned 19. I went into prison. I wasn't a man yet. And I walked into prison. And one thing that I learned was you have to become a man really quick. And so um, the men in there, you know, that were there for years and years um, quickly embraced me and they taught me, you know, they started to teach me different mm -hmm. things that I needed in order to survive in prison. And so um when I got out of prison 17 years later, I once again got embraced by some great men, highly successful men mm -hmm. that I just, you know, happened to befriend. And I realized that there was some commonality between um, the men in prison, what they were teaching me, um, and then the men outside in here that they were teaching me. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this misconception that in prison, it's just all bad. But there's good men in prison that want to teach a young man good qualities and good things to help them survive. So those are the things that mm -hmm. I identified with the men out here that were great men that were teaching me. Mm -hmm. So I uh, were able to condense it down to seven things that I noticed that um, great men 
embody. And so um, that inspired me to write the book because when I got out, I, I realized like, okay, money doesn't necessarily make a man happy. I know plenty of people with all the money they need that aren't happy, aren't fulfilled, still dealing with addictions and all yeah. these things. And then other men who don't have that, but they are happy. So I, I just analyzed it. I did some um, actual group sessions with men to get to learn more about them. And then so for me, it was like, okay, now I want to get this message out there so that if a young man who hasn't had a positive male role model doesn't understand what it means to be a man today, mm -hmm. can pick this book up and have like a blueprint on what that is mm -hmm. and a foundation to build upon. So, um, yeah, it's me just identifying a problem and, um, yeah. and, and, and writing about it and sharing it with uh, other men. So. Yeah, and I guess in a way, really, through the book, you mentoring kind of other young men in the same way that you were mentored by by yeah. some of the you know, by some of the older men in prison and, and subsequently where well, after you kind of coming out and the messages were similar which which i guess is also really interesting i mean if it's okay carlos can we go th let's just go through some of the rules if that's okay um yeah absolutely i'm just, no. just going to go through sequentially i mean obviously we'll only touch on them there's a lot more detail you know obviously in the book but i mean yeah. rule one keep your eyes and ears open mouth shut the power of observation and silence could you say a little bit around that yeah that, how, I, how I that works yeah yeah, those exact words were told to me by a man when I entered prison. Keep your eyes and ears open, mouth shut. He told me that, and I didn't really understand it. Um, but after years and years, over a decade in prison, I realized how how powerful that was, like, and, mm -hmm. and how powerful it is for men out here to um, be a silent observer, right? To be very intentional by what you say. To be, be words are power. Words are very powerful, and if, and as a man, you know, everything we say creates impact in those around us that we say it too. So yeah. it's just being very intentional and very, very careful about what we say, but then also learning to listen. Because one thing I learned when I got out, I was very, I was, in, I was very receptive and listening to everything. And then I was very selective on how I spoke and responded. And that was mm -hmm. like, got me through many, many doors and opportunities. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a powerful rule that every man should embody. And like you mentioned earlier, not just men, but women as well. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, specifically, I know I could speak for the men because of my experiences with this, yeah. but I also yeah. tell women, these are things that everybody should um, in some way uh, develop within themselves so that they can be better versions of themselves. But yeah, it's about just, you know, being observant, being very intentional about what you say, um, listening, uh, actively listening to what people are saying and then think before you respond. Like yeah. that's so key. Um, when you're trying to be uh, successful. Yeah, and then the active li listening, you know, in, in particular, is so important. I mean, I get, I said, certainly in, in the West, in the UK, in the in USA, I don't know, the culture is talk, 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 talk. I mean, it, it, it's, like right. that, it's like that in the US, right? No one's listening. But but I guess but I guess knowledge and connection comes from listening, really. I mean, in order to suck up and really kind of learn from other people's experiences and connect with them, really, you've got to be present, you know, and you've got you've got to listen. Um, and and I guess kind of going into prison, I mean, I, I I mean, I guess you had to do that to survive. I mean, I guess you yeah, know, yeah. Order. yeah, absolutely. Words, the wrong word can get you killed. The wrong word can create a victim within you. So you're very careful about what you say, what you write, what you put out there, mm -hmm. because uh, it's almost like prison is like a bubble and nothing leaves that bubble. So anything that you do say, anything will be never forgotten. And that could be the reason why um, that you don't make it. And so I learned that like, and then out here, same thing, you know, being very careful about um, my words, but then also being an active listener um, and giving people, because there's power in silence, you know, Definitely. there's a lot of power in silence. Um, yeah. And it's almost like, you know, when you're more, when you're more of a, of a selective speaker and you're more silent, when you do speak, people tend to listen more. So yeah. I, I, I think it's a powerful um, rule to live by. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of depth I think, in listening and then choosing your words. You know, I mean, for me, I think strong mindfulness component in that you've got to be present. You've got to manage your own mind. I mean, so let's yeah. maybe come to come to number two. Number two, earn your bones. Could you, yeah, yeah. Just say a little bit about that, Carlos? 
Yeah, same thing. When I went in, guy told me like, look, everything you did out there in the, in the streets doesn't matter. You have to come in here and you have to earn your bones. You have to earn your name, your reputation, um, who you are as a person is going to be judged by every act that you do daily. And so um, I found that to be very true in prison and is actually part of survival. Like you have to, um, and it's in, and then it started off in a negative way for me. Like it was about me knowing when I first went in, in order for me to earn my bones, it meant for me to have to fight, for me to have to um, engage in violent activities in order to survive. But then later when I transformed my life, um, I realized that, okay, now I got to earn my, my bones in a different area of life, meaning yeah. like as a person who can help others. So I had to earn that by spending years working on myself. So out here, same thing. Like I got out, um, and I knew that, okay, nobody owes me anything. Um, and the only reason I'm only getting opportunities out here in the world is if I provide value, if I earn my bones, if I put the work in, right? If, I, if I'm a person that people can rely on, if I show people that I'm loyal, if I show people that I'm a hard worker, that's all part of earning yeah. your bones. If you show that in time, people will give you opportunities, doors will open, um, great things will happen. And so earning your bones is just understanding that you need to put in the work if you expect people to give you that respect and honor and opportunities and be successful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely kind of modeling, you know, a way of being in the world. And, and let, let's just come down to uh, rule three. I mean, rule three, I'm a, I'm a massive advocate for exercise and mental health. I mean, literally, it is about, I mean, as you know, Carlos, it is the best thing for mental health. So I loved it that the, the rule three was mandatory bust down. Fitness is a cornerstone for men. I mean, you're preaching to the choir here, but <laughs> say, say, say a little bit about why this is so important. Yeah, as you know, uh, fitness and, and working out, and I'm not saying you need to like be like this like, super workout head, but like no. implementing exercise in your life every day helps you mentally, physically, in every way. Like the only thing That's that right. I had in prison that, that helped me get through that mentally was working out daily because yeah. it relieved stress, anger, um, all these, it made me feel like I accomplished something. It made me feel good afterward. So I know that this worked for me and many other men in prison. Like, yeah. and so out here, I continue that. And I realized that men out here, the successful ones were implementing that in their life. And so um, it's a no brainer, you know, implementing that and the importance of that. Um, it extends further than just physical, you know, it's so much deeper yeah. than that. So I'm a big advocate for, you know, exercise and, and, and implementing that in, in your daily routine. Yeah, yeah, and then the link between exercise and well-being, exercise and mood, exercise and mental resilience, so so important. Yeah, I'd like to say, cause I, mean, I guess somebody, I mean, everyone's got different kind of capacity for exercise, but even a walk, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, even getting yeah. out, going for a walk, you know, it, it kind of it creates it, it creates endorphins, changes the brain. I mean, for mental health, it is absolutely the the best thing. And so, let's just come to rule uh, to rule four. So cell time, uh, the art of solitary growth. Another one I really resonated with. Say, say a bit more about what you, about raw, about this rule, Carlos, what you mean. Yeah, this one I'm like still really big on today. Like yeah. just being um, alone, being in solitude with my thoughts, with my reflections, with my dreams, with my goals, with my prayer, like whatever it is you believe in, like the importance of having that alone time. Some people are afraid to be alone and, and to listen to their thoughts and to they need to always be around people and i don't yeah. and i think that there's like you have every man and every woman for that matter should should take time you know and maybe not daily i do it daily but maybe it's weekly and just go into your own space yeah. and like ask yourself like where do i want to go next in life like what are my plans like where have i come from at look at your life and that takes for you to be alone in solitude and just to take the perspective of that so in prison yeah when you're locked in the cell with uh, sometimes another man for 24 hours a day for years, you know, the only time you really feel that you can get like some level of peace, right, is when like you're alone. So like there would be a routine where like my cellmate would go to the yard for a couple hours. I would stay in the cell and get that moment of cell time, that clarity to like, you know, even just talk to myself if I wanted to. You know, you don't feel the presence of another human being. That's energy. So 
you right. you separate yourself and there and we did that we rotated that and it helped us a lot uh, mentally um and spiritually and so out here i do the same thing so i i take active retreats um or just maybe getting away in the morning when it's quiet in a separate room but this is very important if you want to grow as a person so yeah yeah and i would really agree with that i mean whether it is yeah just getting out for a walk on your own going for a walk in nature mm -hmm. meditation meditation reading it's all sorts exactly. of ways to have that solitary time but i don't know whether you'd agree with this but but again i think in the west you know it, it's it, we live in a society of constant noise constant yeah. noise you know and and you know and being busy isn't it it's almost like the you know the god in the west is being busy but you know but i think being busy it doesn't give us that time to reflect, to sit back, to have solitary time, to plan, to grow. To it's just constant future, isn't it? I don't know whether yeah. You, you, yeah, you see it the same way. Yeah, same thing. It's just all yeah. day phones. You get up in the morning, your phones beeping, emails, phone calls, like all these things. It's just <laughs> fast paced. So yeah. actively putting all that out to the side, being yeah. alone, yeah. you know, with a book or with your thoughts or with your journal or you know, just meditating. Man, that's so powerful if you do that a little bit each day. Um, if you can implement that, you, you it'll help a lot, especially, I know from experience and other men, especially with men, because men have a lot of responsibility. They carry a lot on their shoulders, a lot of men, and um, it's it's critical to have that time, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think depending on the individual, you know, without that time, I think the, the capacity to get overwhelmed, to get angry to get frustrated it's just there isn't it you know people just people just get overwhelmed and then that kind of spills out into their life you know in lots of different ways and and also kind of staying on the shore I mean, you know i'm just looking back at, at your first book and learning and personal development i mean this is something you've done you know in solitary time you still do in solitary time it's a it's a really important part of your program isn't it could you just say a little bit around i don't know how how it's changed your life and and you know how you you know talk about kind of the power of learning to some of the groups that you work with yeah um man personal development just learning yeah. reading um going to groups has been critical in my life um yeah. you know getting help from people who can give me life advice on next steps is so yeah. important and yeah, I think uh, I wouldn't be here today if it had it not been for like the amazing people. And some of those people aren't even alive anymore. Some of those people have come to me through books, yeah. right? Through literature, you know, like uh, you yeah. mentioned Viktor Frankl, like I never met him, you know, I, but his story, his book that he left behind impacted me in such a profound way, like many others. So that's why for me, it's like giving that back to others now, you know, if I, you know, leave this earth tomorrow, at least I'd have something here they can like help others potentially. You never know who's going to pick that book up or no. listen to that piece of content or listen no. to this podcast. So um, I think that men uh, uh, and women, but men, um, since that's kind of what we're speaking on, mm -hmm. it's like looking for that, seeking out that that help mm -hmm. in whatever way that you need to, mm -hmm. um, being vulnerable, being open is only going to help you be better. It's not a weakness. It's a strength. Um, and I know because like, I oh I was one of those people that felt like at one point that it was weak to seek help, but once I realized that that's like just not true, um, and it actually helped make you stronger, then uh, I'm now I'm just falling in on it. So yeah, but but it's it, it's such an important message because I mean I don't know what the suicide rate for men is in the US, but it, but over here, Carson, it's really bad. I mean the, 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 yeah. I forget exactly what it is, but lots and lots of men not asking for help, internalizing, becoming really, really kind of, you know, really, really dangerously, emotionally, you know, overregulated and, and then just taking their own lives. It's so common. And I think this is a message for men because there is a, I guess there's the, the historic message, you know, that men have been on the, on the, on the receiving end of man up, don't show your feelings, a strong man doesn't ask for help. You know, I mean, yeah. and these are strong messages and these messages, I think, are still really present for men even now, really. You know, so asking for help, I think, can be difficult for men. I don't know. Would, would, would you agree with that? It's quite difficult, I think, for some men to reach out and ask for help and be vulnerable. Absolutely. And I I, I was in a maximum security prison in California, mm -hmm. um, some of the toughest prisons in the nation. And 
you're around some of the hardest, strongest men you can imagine, um, mentally, physically, in all kinds of different ways. And once I was exposed to that world and realized that those, even the men in there, those who sought help, you know, um, that they were able to even become stronger and eventually like overcome those, those old ways and start to do good things right in life. I'm like, there's something powerful here. So for men out there thinking that it's a weakness, it definitely isn't because some of the strongest men in the world actually um, seek help in any way that they can. And maybe it's just starting off personally on your own, you know, like just doing your own stuff. And that's where I started. And then eventually getting out and learning from others. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, the asking for help, I think, is so important. And, and you know, and I think a lot, lot of people internalise, you know, emotions. You know, women do it, men do it. I think men do it more, honestly. You know, but I think the danger with internalising is, I mean, some people can do it for 40 years until the day they can't do it, you know, and then it all starts kind of overflowing. So, I mean, that, I think, is such, such an important message. So, so let's move on to rule five. Yeah, rule five. So staying dangerous, embracing the warrior within. Could you say a little bit, bit more about that rule? Yeah, staying dangerous was something that um, used to be told to me when I was in prison as well. And I didn't really fully understand what it meant when I started to hear it. Uh, but then eventually I asked somebody about it. And it was just about like staying mentally dangerous, like like knowing that, you know, you have to be a warrior in a certain aspect internally. And whether that's and not meant necessarily like harming people but like being mentally sharp being um being confident you know understanding knowing that you have that that innate warrior within you as a man um and knowing how to yield that you know knowing how to put that out there in your own unique way and so for me i realized that my warrior and that i still have this day and that i still continue to like make sure i stay dangerous is like me as an intellect me as a person who I know that sometimes I have to go into a situation and be able to outthink the next person if I want to be able to accomplish something or be able to even compete in certain like the playing fields in life. Because you have people that are very successful in life that, you know, are in, in positions of power that, in, that could be the difference between my company succeeding or not. So I know I need to mentally be prepared to go toe to toe with that person, whether it's, you know, in a me convincing them that you know it's enough something me getting a point across and if i don't work on myself consistently um in that way then i'm not going to be able to win that battle so mm -hmm. it's understanding that like we all have a, a warrior within us right we all have something within us mm -hmm. and that goes back to you know just our own like innate qualities as men we have that within us like and so it's knowing that and then it's identifying it, what it is for you and then sharpening it and making sure that you stay dangerous because we live in a world where, um, you know, it's it's very hard. The world is tough. It's not easy. Yeah, you're going to deal with challenges. You're going to deal with struggles. You're going to deal with loss. You know, you're going to deal with, with a lot of adversity. And if you're not sharp and if you're not yeah. staying dangerous, then yeah. it's like you're going to you're going to end up something's going to happen to you. Or you're not going to be able to deal with some of the adversity. Yeah. So it's just for me continuously to develop in those areas in that inner warrior. And so in that chapter, that's what I talk about. And uh, I've noticed that in all men, like men who, you know, whether you have a business or whether you're a CEO, you know, you're a, you're, you're a podcaster, you have competitors in life, and but you want to grow because you want to get your, you want to, you want to evolve and be better. So how are you going to compete with these competitors? You have to stay dangerous. You have to continue to develop. And so that's what it is, is understanding the importance of that. Yeah, and, and how do people do that, Carlos? It's going to be different for everyone, but, I mean, what would you say? I mean, how do, how do people stay dangerous, stay sharp, stay, you know, kind of engaged? What, what, what can they do to really, really kind of connect with that, that inner warrior? Yeah, it's, a, it's actively working on yourself every day, uh, yeah. working your field. Whatever your field is, whatever your domain expertise is, whatever, you know, you're pursuing in life, it's like, developing in that area so that means learning more about it you know um, getting more experience in it or uh, uh, getting mentorship in that area um you know just never feeling like that you're just done because in the way the world is now the way that the world is evolving and increasing like literally like like a year ago 
you know, it's so different now than it was a year ago. Like the world is moving at a fast pace. Yeah. So if you're not constantly keeping up, you're not constantly learning and, and, and being receptive to new things and being clear, you're closed off, then you're going to get left behind. You know, you're going to get, you're going to lose. So it's like, a, it's like a, if we look at like a sports analogy, um, if we look at the game of, uh, of soccer and you know, okay, the, the goal is to get the cup. So you need to do everything you have to do to get there. So you have to do all the way down to what you put into your body, what you're eating every day. What yeah. time are you waking up? How many hours of sleep are you getting? Are you training? How many hours? Okay. Then like, how are you connecting with your team and building as a team, as an individual? So it's so many things, but the best thing to do is to identify your goal, your big goal, your dream, whatever that is, and then breaking it down to the lowest common denominator and realizing that, okay, I need to start here and get better at this and get better at this and get better at this. And then that's how you sharpen the warrior within. And that's how you stay dangerous in a world that you need to be competitive in whatever it is you're doing in life. Yeah, and it really does pull in some of the other rules. I mean, when you, I think at the end of the book, you say a lot of these rules intersect, you know, and they really do. I mean, staying staying sharp, you know, connecting with the warrior within. Yeah, I mean, the power of routine, um, the, the physical fitness, the, you know, the, the, the listening, the learning, I guess it, it all kind of fits in, fits in there, really. I mean, and just, just a, a question before we move on to the next rule. Do, do you get from men that, what I get from a lot of men is they're confused. I think, I, I mean, a, a lot of men are confused around what their role now is because there, there's, the, there's the traditional kind of yeah. idea of masculinity which is which is passing out you know there's a lot of negative there you know understandably and then there's the kind of new expectancies of men to be partly the old type you know strong resilient you know really embodying that masculine energy but also vulnerable asking for help connecting high empathy do you feel that men, a lot of men, are a bit unsure around, you know, what masculinity actually is now, what they're expected to do? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Yeah. Um, if not the reason, because that's and that's why it's titled Warrior in the Garden, because the yeah. garden yeah. represents the world we live in now. Right. This world has become more softer, more even though there's still things going on. It's definitely not a world of 100 years ago. Right. No, or the 20th no. century, yeah. you know, when all, so the world is like this garden and, and the warrior is us men, because like I said, within us, there's that inner warrior, no matter what man you are, it's there, what kind of man you are. And so it's understanding the balance, like that, that the warrior in the garden, you know, could still coexist together. So the warrior can still be the warrior in the beautiful garden, right. With the serene, of it and the, and, the, and the gentleness of it, you know, you could still be that. And so in the book, it's like identifying these, these rules that I feel that the men who don't know, they may feel confused or may feel like out of place or don't know where they need to be at in this day and age. Yeah. It's, it's like understanding that you can still um, live by these rules, embody these rules, be these things, mm -hmm. right? And that's still going to allow you to be um, an effective man and feel fulfilled and accomplished in the world yeah. that's kind of becoming like a garden and it expects you to be mm. um, in a garden and change. But you don't have to change as a man. It's just about understanding the balance between the two. So I, I, I definitely feel that. And I just want to, like I said, wrote the book because men really are confused and they don't know how to, like, what to be in the world, especially yeah. out here, you know, like where I'm at in, yeah. in Los Angeles. Um, you know, sometimes men feel under attack and even women advocate for men that like that the men feel that way and that the men are afraid to be their innate selves. So for me, it's just about understanding what this, what this book is understanding, first of all, what it, it means to be a man, what things, what qualities um, uh, are, are that a man has, and then how to like develop in those areas in a way to where you're not you know, going to be like outcast from society, you know, you're not like, yeah. you know, so, so yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I hope that in some way that this book can help those men and help those men have a guide and feel like that there's other men out there who feel what they feel and are going through what they're going through. Yeah. Um, because I definitely do. And, you know, in society, you, the way that I'm living now, especially growing up 
around nothing but men in a very tense environment for so many years now to get out here and have to adapt to the garden, um, which I've done, but it's because of these rules. I follow these rules. This is what I do all the time. This is my life in this book. Um, and I'm happy and I'm successful and I'm fulfilled. And I just wanted to share that with others. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it's the structure that you give for men in that book, which yeah. allows them to connect with their innate masculinity, I guess, and mm -hmm. then to go out. And, and I was going to ask you why you called it Warrior in the Garden. You've just explained. So so it yeah. is kind of really, you know, mainly connected to that kind of innate masculine warrior kind of, you know, image whilst being in the changing garden, really, of, of you know, of conditions and environment and, and culture. Carlos, let, let me ask you about rule six. And I know this rule has been, you know, as you said, really important to you. Who you roll with, the power of finding your tribe. Yeah. Why, yeah. why is that there? It's it's funny because, uh, I mean, you go into prison, the first thing the person asks you is who you roll with, who are you with? There's nobody alone in prison. Everybody's a part of a tribe. Okay. Um, even if you're not affiliated with any type of uh, organization or gang or anything, you're still going to be a part of somebody, something. Um, even religious, you know, Christians, Muslims, Catholics have their their tribes. So um, when I learned that and I went into prison, I'm like, OK, everybody has their tribe. And so at first it was just about seeing it in a negative way that, OK, these are gangs, these are tribes and we're just hurting people. But then eventually I once I transformed my life. My tribe became a group of men from diverse areas, just different backgrounds, and we built each other up. We worked, we helped work on each other. Mm -hmm. We mentored each other. We had each other's back. We fed each other. Mm -hmm. I realized the power of that, like to not feel alone in this world, yeah. that you have other men that can help you become stronger. They can help you deal with the challenges of life. They can be there like your brothers. And I think this goes back even further, like in the beginning, like, uh, um, I read a book called uh, Tribe. Um, forgot the author, but yeah, I've, talks read, about, I've read that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks about that, like how, mm -hmm. um, like we have a tribe mentality, where like we're gonna be a part of something. Um, and so me identifying that, understanding, like, okay, so who are those people in your tribe? Yeah. What tribe are you creating? What tribe are you a part of? So as a man, like, be very, um careful and be very intentional about who is your tribe right and like i said in the book you could start off with like i did when i got out i joined um a, a catholic men's group uh, called fishers of men we meet every wednesday morning at 6 30 and we get together and we literally just we pray we talk to each other we build we, and we talk about our challenges our adversity and it's so empowering yeah. and these are men that at any time i can text or call and get help from guidance assistance that's the type of tribe that a man needs to be a part of. And maybe it's not a religious one. Maybe it's a different kind. Maybe it's just a group of guys who get together and drink beers and just talk and shoot the shit. That's cool too. Yeah. But I say you have to yeah. find your tribe. I feel like no man can be reach his full potential without being a part of a tribe. Um, yeah. And so that's why I think this is so important in this rule. Yeah, and do you know what, Carlos? I, I, I so agree with that. And, and I have to say men are so bad at that, aren't they? I mean, especially mm -hmm. men moving into middle age, you know, I, you know, I mean, what happens, I mean, this is a bit of a generalization, but I think it's often true. Men lose their connections. You know, yeah. I, I think and this is, I mean, I'm going to make a massive general statement around gender, but I just think women are so much better at this than men. Men, men's lives can just shrink if they're not careful. Yeah. They don't keep in touch with friends, you know, and that is a terrible thing. Men become isolated. I mean, is that something that you see as men tend to get older? Like yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So isolated. I know so yeah. many men that like every day their life just consists of getting up, going to work, coming back, and then isolating themselves in a room watching TV. Yeah. Like just for years and years and years. And then I'm yeah. like, but when I, I, I've actually actively put together a men's group where I identified these men, men from all walks of life, some retired, some doctors, some lawyer, whatever. Yeah business people that were doing this and I brought them all together in a room and I like I was vulnerable they start to be vulnerable and just in that one um little just in that moment just in that moment we were together like it was just such a powerful thing and then they all asked me like what are we going to do it again so maybe you'd be a leader in your in your community and start these groups for the men within your community if you identify it but 
yeah, it's so powerful to have these 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 tribes, these men groups. So I'm I'm, I'm an advocate for it. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, men's groups are kind of growing here. You know, there's uh, there's a few men's groups, but it's really, really small, you know, but so important for men to to be, you know, within groups and to share. And the group you were talking about, the Catholic group, wow, that, that must be so nourishing, Carlos, to have people that, you, that are just there for each other. Amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's so important. And um, I'm, I'm part of that one and another one, another group, and it's just... Uh, and I, it's part of like going back to the other one, like, you know, sharpening yourself and I'm um, staying dangerous. You know, you, you, yeah. you, you stay dangerous by learning from other men around you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the group dynamic, you know, and I, I don't need to tell you this, Carlos, but the group dynamic is so powerful, isn't it? I mean, sit, sitting in a group with other people who are, you know, open or even if they're not open. And, and and sharing you know it's just so so powerful so so we, we'd be running Absolutely. out of time as i knew we would but let's come to rule, rule, rule seven i know this has also been really really important in your own life um kind of programming structuring discipline into your day could you say talk a little bit about that one yeah this is just like you mentioned the power of routine mm. you know programming getting into a program like mentally i got through prison by programming Yeah. Like having a certain thing I did every day at a certain time consistently over time helped me not only just not dwell on the time that I was in prison, to it allowed me to develop as a person. So once I changed my life around and I started to implement the routine of, of, of reading and studying and reflecting and writing and working out all these different things, the days went by, I felt better, I was growing as a person, I saw the growth. And so creating a program i believe every man should have a program should have a routine Great. routine we, there's been all kind of studies about the health benefits of having a routine yeah. um and it just yeah. modeling that behavior for the younger people who are looking at you it's yeah. seeing like okay my dad or my uncle my brother whatever is very structured he has a routine he gets things done he's making accomplishments because if you have a routine and you're implementing things that are positive, you're going to make progress in life and people are going to notice that. Definitely. So Definitely. importance yeah. of that, I think that's critical too. And, um, and a part of that routine is implementing some of these other rules, right? Bust down, you know, yeah. reflection, solitude. Yeah. That's a part of it. So yeah. definitely important to have that program. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. To have a framework, you know, I mean, I, I, I talk to a lot of clients about mental health scaffolding, which is kind of similar, really. There's things yeah. you do every day in order to promote your well-being and to push you forward. Learning would be one of those. Um, I mean, this has been, you know, fantastic. And I just wanted to kind of ask you, Carlos, at the end, what's your name? <laughs> Can you just say, what, you don't have to say too much about it, but um, could you say a little bit about your next project? Or, yeah. or not your next because I know you're you're, no, no, yeah. you're writing Absolutely. your next book. Yeah, I don't um, want to preempt the book, but <laughs> no, no, no. I it's funny because I'm in the, the ideation process of my next book. Yeah. I don't even know what it's going to be yet, technically, okay. but I know that I'm working on it because I'm like my mind is is a constantly aware to the world. On it's going that I'm looking for it now in the world yeah. because every yeah. idea that comes to me comes to me through like some type of message, you know. It could be like me just being inspired by one thing I saw and I'm like, yeah. okay, I need to do something on that. So um, I'm in the process of that, but I don't know what, exactly what that is, but I just started a podcast to myself um, last uh, month. Yes, I I've, I've seen that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so that's always been something yeah. that I've wanted to do and people have been telling me I should do, mm. but I never pulled the trigger on it. And I, I finally did uh, last month and I've already done three interviews I have one more I'm launching next week. And then I have another one um, that I'm recording um, for the week after. And so, but how to battle podcast is just like, it, it's just incredible individuals who overcome extreme battles in their life. Yeah. Like some of the men that helped inspire me to write this book are that I've already interviewed. And then I have a young lady coming on there who had a stroke when she was a kid. And now she's like this huge, um, Instagram, YouTube star, and just always smiling and happy and just, but her, but it's all about overcoming the battle and then like finding, like triumphing over the battle because now the person is actually using that battle as like to accelerate who they are today as an individual, right? To like, and not letting that, not being a victim to it, 
right? But letting, but understand that the battle made them into who they're supposed to yeah. be. So that's what the podcast, so that's my, my, my project I'm working on now. And, um, yeah. And then, uh, the book, next book, I'll probably have a solid idea within the next few months. Okay, great. Yeah, you must come on the show again with, with yeah. to, to promote yeah. your next book. How do people get hold of this book, Carlos? If he, if our listeners want to want to read the book, how, how do they get hold of it? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, the, the um, if you go to at How to Battle on Instagram or yep. um, How to Battle on YouTube and um, LinkedIn, is Carlos Vasquez. Uh, there's a links that link to the book itself, which is on Amazon, but or you can go straight to Amazon. Uh, put warrior in the garden seven rules for men and then my name and then it'll pop up um they can find it there, there. and uh, also um my website is howtobattle.com which has every you can purchase it from there so in any of those areas you can um purchase the book which also find out other work that i'm doing in the podcast and um stuff i'm doing on youtube and stuff so yeah all those areas you can find me so yeah, and we'll we'll I'll, I'll get all of your links after the show, Carlos, and we'll put our links, all of your links on our social mm-hmm. media sites. Um, How to battle probably is the best place. There's, there's so much content on there, isn't it, for for people? Just yeah. as a final question, Carlos, is there anything that you would have liked to have said today that I've not given you the opportunity to? Um, no, I I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk about my book. Um, this is actually the first time that I've done it. Uh, really got deep into the book and the rules itself since I launched the book um, last month. And I um, I just feel that, um, you know, I'm just one individual trying to create an impact in the world. So I would say that uh, my message would be is, is everybody listening to be that individual and the people in your sphere of influence to spread some positivity, something good, put something good out there in the world. Um, I feel if enough people do that, then we can literally change the world, right? Um, yeah. And not underestimating the power of the individual because we all have something within us to really create a big impact in this world if we want to. So that would be like my final message to get out there. Yeah, and you know, that's a, that's a message that I really agree with. That is a really wonderful message to finish with. Yeah. So, Carlos, I just want to say how nice it's been to see you again and thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's been a, It's been really inspirational. As it, as it thank you, Mark. And once again, I'd like to say thank you so much to Carlos for coming on the show again. Um, uh, as our listeners will agree, it was a really, really fascinating interview. And we, I'm really glad we were able to get into the book. I'm um, just holding it up now for our viewers on our YouTube channel. I would thoroughly recommend the book, Warrior in the Garden, Seven Rules for Men. Uh, I've read it a couple of times and I found it to be fantastic. And Carlos draws on all of his experience, you know, both being incarcerated for 17 years and also, you know, after coming out and building his coaching business and you know, inspirational, being an inspirational speaker, mentor, and all of the things that, that Carlos does um and the seven rules kind of underpinning a way for men to be in the world giving men a framework you know for for being uh and as carlos says later in the book you know a lot of the rules kind of intersect with each other as i guess one would expect really uh, so i'm really really glad we got to cover them all uh i wanted to read uh just a paragraph out of carlos's book um and carlos writes in the conclusion this book is a call to accountability a mirror held up to your actions, a challenge to your convictions and a guide to create a better path. The seven rules for men born from the challenging confines of prison life extend far beyond these walls, offering timeless wisdom for the modern man. They are not just guidelines, but catalysts for profound personal growth and a call to embrace a more intentional, resilient and honourable way of living. Remember, the path to true manhood is not predetermined nor easy. It is a path forged through discipline, resilience, courage and introspection. So I, I had to read that, you know, because that really, really resonates with, you know, Carlos's kind of personal story and, you know, all of the life experiences he brings um, and all, also all of the growth through suffering, 
Uh, I talk a lot about post-traumatic growth on the show and uh, and post-traumatic growth is not always a given. uh, And obviously people that experience trauma, you know, I mean, they, there's a lot of darkness with the trauma, obviously, you know, and a lot of difficulty to to work through, you know, but but sometimes people do develop accelerated growth, growth through suffering. And I think Carlos is, you know, a really, really good demonstration of this, you know, and transmuting his own suffering and trauma to a life of helping others, you know, through all of the the aspects of, you know, of his of his business coaching, inspirational speaking, mentoring, group, books. Um, I mean, Carlos is such an inspirational guy. Um, We're so lucky to have had him back back on the show for series two. We talked a little bit around um, the benefits of exercise as one of the rules. I mean, as our listeners will know, you know, I'm I'm a big fan um, of exercise for mental health. You know, it's it's. uh, thoroughly backed up with research so it was really great that that was in one of carlos's rules you know exercise is so good for mood mental resilience um so so good for the brain really you know as well as the body you know so many of the rules you know really kind of you know connect with carlos's story you know finding your tribe um so important for carlos you know both in prison and when he came out of prison, finding his tribe, you know, and something that, as we said in the show, I think men are not always great at, you know, especially men as they get older is what I find really. I think it's so easy, as Carlos said, for men to become really, really isolated and just go to work, come back, watch TV, go to work, come back, watch TV, internalize their emotions, you know, and obviously that is not a great way of being, you know, and I think, you know, when Carlos talks about the power of group, there's a lot more men's groups now uh, and some somewhat more focus on, you know, on men being in groups and sharing experiences. But I have to say there there is, you know, a, a lifetime, many lifetimes, generations of messaging to tell men not to open up, to be strong. You've got to, to be a man. You can't ask for help, etc. Man up, you know, a strong man doesn't show emotion. You know, all of these things are just passed down implicitly or explicitly you know through the generations and i think it leaves men now really unsure really of their of their role you know i think with a lot of men wanting to embrace the kind of idea of a new man you know a man that opens up their vulnerability that connects to others that connects to other men that shares that asks for help that you know kind of that, that, that lives a life where they're open and have compassion, you know, for, for others. And then that, I think, just bangs up against the traditional messaging around men being stoic and not sharing and not opening up their emotions, you know. And I think there is still a way to go. I mean, I, I honestly, you know, I have to say, even though the messaging probably to men is a lot better now than it than it was even when I was growing up, I have to say there's still a long way to go. You know, I mean, when you look at some of the some of the male role models on TV, you know, action movies. I mean, what are these, what are these men? I mean, I just think, I mean, this is an old one, but um, Bruce Willis on Die Hard. So, you know, what, what is Bruce Willis doing? Not feeling emotion. Well, he feels emotion at the end when I think he meets his family, but, you know, but going through, you know, killing and jumping through windows and no emotion, you know, no empathy, just kind of action, action, action. Yeah. And I, and I guess, you know, when Carlos talks about finding the warrior within, yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is a part of masculinity, you know, um, taking action and, you know, and kind of being dynamic. But I think the way it's portrayed, especially through film, I think it's very, very one dimensional still, really, you know, the kind of cult of the man who doesn't show emotion. Um, I think he's still very much there, you know, and uh, and kind of the Bruce Willis character just to stay with that, you know, I mean, you look at you look at his life in the film and what is his life, you know, he's divorced, he's living on his own, he's drinking too much, he's flat, he's filthy, you know, I mean, these, this, this kind of messaging that I think, you know, that is very, very damaging to men, although there is a change, you know, men are more open, are you know, becoming more vulnerable, I mean, there is change in society, but I think there is still a long way to go um what a great interview we've got some we've also got some some shows coming up over the next couple of weeks 
Um, so look out for those. Um, if you want to get in touch with Carlos for any of the things that he does, um, please check out the show notes and our social media sites where we'll have Carlos, Carlos's links. If you want to buy the book, and I would really, really recommend you do, it's a great read. Um, check out Carlos's website, or you can buy it from Amazon. I, I bought it from, from Amazon. Carlos's second book, and I'd also reference Carlos's first book, The Price, which I also read a few times and, and really, really liked. Uh, and so really looking forward to Carlos's third book. <laughs> I kind of pressed him a little bit for that. He's just finished his second book. But yeah, but hopefully Carlos will agree to come on the show and uh, and talk about his third book. Um, as always, um, I ask our listeners and also our watchers on YouTube and the audio podcast listeners to subscribe. Really important in so many different ways that you subscribe. Um, so many people listen to the podcast and don't subscribe. That is really common according to research. Um, but if you are enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe. Uh, and please do comment. You know, I mean, comments, good, bad, neutral. Joe and I absolutely love the comments. We love the feedback. So please do feedback. Uh, and if there are any guests that, or any subjects that you'd like us to cover, um, then please just get in touch and we'll do our best to to cover them. Um, yeah, and just uh, another great show. Um, got another couple in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and as always, just want to thank our listeners for listening. Uh, I want to thank Joe, the producer, and, and uh, Joe does all the production in the background, as you know. So thank Joe for all the hard work that he does. Um, and as always, look after yourselves look after each other and look after the planet and i'll see you next week on the next episode thanks as always for listening